Okay, believe it or not, we've almost reached the end of our gene expression adventure. So we've learned fundamental concepts of, for gene expression. We've gone through the process of gene transcription. We've seen how messenger RNA gets modified in eukaryotes with the spliceosome. We've also uh, worked through the steps of gene translation and examined the molecular details to that process of translation. And so now we're going to talk a bit more about DNA mutations and different types of mutations and their consequences. Because now that we've gone through and examined this process of gene expression, we can now really start to understand how or the different types of impacts that DNA mutations can have on the final protein product uh, that gets produced through the process of gene expression. Okay, so, uh, you know, given all that, you know, what's the deal with mutations? And here's actually a, a molecular illustration of a mutation caused by a compound that's found in cigarette smoke. So there's a lot of different uh, physical and chemical factors that can interact with DNA that can cause mutations in addition to the mistakes that happen during the process of DNA replication. So uh, these DNA mutations can happen to a group of nucleotides. So there can be a large shift in a chromosome in an organism or mutations can be what are called point mutations. So a mutation that happens at a single nucleotide point. And actually, we've already seen an example of uh, one of these second types of mutations, of point mutations, uh, whether you knew it or not, uh, when we were learning about sickle cell disease. So in sickle cell disease, there's actually a single mutation, a single nucleotide that differs between the beta globin molecule for wild type individuals and the beta globin molecule for an individual that has sickle cell. And so that's just illustrated in this cartoon here. What's happened, if we look at the upper strand, is originally we started with a sequence of CTC. And in the mutant version, we've now gone to CAC. So the A and T wound up being switched. And in this case, this upper strand is the template strand. So that is the strand that is complementary to the messenger RNA that gets transcribed uh, for, to produce this beta globin protein, which is part of a hemoglobin molecule. So in, in uh, wild type beta globin, uh, the mRNA will have the sequence GAG, whereas the mutant uh, mRNA will instead have a sequence GUG. So if we go to this chart uh, that translates from each uh, codon, each triplet codon, to an amino acid, if we look up GAG, so G a, G, down at the bottom of the chart, it may be hidden by my head, but you should be able to see it on the lecture slide, that codes for glutamate. And in contrast, in the mutant beta globin DNA, now we have the sequence G, U, G, so G, U, G, so now that sequence codes for valine instead. And now each of these amino acids has a very different molecular structure. And so uh, if you switch one amino acid for another amino acid, that's going to impact the process of protein folding because we're going from you know, potentially something that's polar to something that's nonpolar, something that has a different shape, you know, maybe it's now something that can form a disulfide bridge or something that can form an ionic bond. And that's different from what was there previously. So the final shape of that protein is going to change just by changing a single amino acid, which is the product of a single change to the uh, nucleotides in the DNA for that gene. But... As we scrutinize this table, 
you should start to notice something, which is not all changes to a DNA sequence are going to have the same impact. So a while ago, in a previous video, I talked about how there is wobble at the third codon position. So for example, if we look at serine here, again, it doesn't matter what base is in that third codon position, all of these are going to code for serine. So if there is a point mutation that happens at the third position in a codon that codes for serine, we're still going to wind up with the same end product of serine. So we call this type of mutation a silent mutation because yes, there's been a mutation, but it didn't change the end product after translation. That's really kind of amazing when you think about it. So not all mutations cause a change. However, when they do, there are different specific types of changes that can happen. And so you need to know the names of these different types of changes and what this functional consequence is uh, of different types of mutations. So uh, the first example that I gave you for sickle cell is an example of what's called a missense mutation. So in a missense mutation, one amino acid is exchanged for another. So uh, if this is our original wild type individual, so here's our DNA template, here's our messenger RNA, and here's our protein that's produced uh, from translating that messenger RNA. Down here, what's happened is there's been a single change from a C to a T. And so in the mRNA, there's now A instead of G. And so instead of this amino acid ending with glycine, it now ends with serine. So again, very similar to what we've seen for uh, sickle cell. So this missense mutation just trades one amino acid for another. And again, you know, depending on the amino acids involved, that could be a substantial change or it could be a trivial change. So the next type of mutation is called a nonsense mutation. And so now a non, with a nonsense mutation, that type of point mutation changes a codon from a codon that codes for a specific amino acid to a codon that now codes for a stop codon. So a nonsense mutation will introduce a stop codon earlier in the messenger RNA. So translation will stop early. And so what you'll end up getting from a nonsense mutation is a shortened amino acid because now instead of chugging along and translating and translating and translating, uh, um, the ribosome is going to encounter this stop codon and it's done. So that is again a nonsense mutation. Things can get even weirder. So those are simple point mutations, but in other cases uh, there can wind up being either an insertion of an extra base into the DNA or deletion of a base from DNA. And when there's an insertion or deletion, that type of mutation is referred to as a frame shift mutation because what it does is it shifts the reading frame for those three base groups for, the coat, for each codon. It's gonna shift that reading frame so that now um, it's reading a different sequence of three bases from what it had been reading originally. Um, you can kind of think of this as being a little bit like if you're reading a sentence where the words are spaced out with spaces, now suddenly the spaces are at different points in those words and you wind up with something that doesn't make any sense anymore. Uh, so in the example here for a frame shift mutation, 
uh, that's actually resulted in uh, a nonsense mutation specifically. So in this case, uh, what's happened is an extra A has been inserted uh, into the DNA uh, sequence. And so when that gets translated to mRNA, uh, we go from uh, a codon that originally coded for lysine to a codon that now codes for uh, stop. Uh, and so in this case, um, what's happened is a frame shift that has caused, as this describes, immediate nonsense, right? So that nonsense mutation, premature stop codon, so a frame, sh frame shift mutation could lead to a nonsense mutation. A frame shift mutation could also lead to a missense mutation. So let's take a look at this example. So here, um, an A has been removed. And so now uh, what that means is uh, for this third codon, uh, instead of coding for uh, uh, this amino acid, um, it now codes for a different amino acid, right? But then on top of that, it doesn't just change a single amino acid, right? So that's shifted the reading frame for every single amino acid past that point, every amino acid that's downstream for that protein. So now instead of having uh, glycine at the end, we have alanine and so forth and so on. And actually in this case, uh, there's no longer a stop codon here. So this is going to build a completely different protein. So a frame shift mutation could lead to a nonsense mutation, or it could lead to a missense mutation as shown here. Along with that, in some cases, it might be that more than one nucleotide gets deleted. And so if three nucleotides happen to be deleted in one spot, as shown here, in that case, that's going to result in an amino acid that goes missing. And just as having the wrong amino acid could change protein function, having a missing amino acid could also lead to a change in protein function. Okay, so spend some time thinking about those different types of mutations and their consequences for gene translation. Uh, and so just to recap briefly, um, we've seen how some types of mutations, especially point mutations, might not do much of anything, so they're silent mutations. Other mutations could cause uh, missense or they could cause nonsense, so either a change in the amino acids or a premature stop codon. And those will have huge impacts on the protein product that is produced for that gene. So I want to wrap this up actually by coming back to the question at the start of this set of lecture videos, which is, you know, here we've been exploring the process of how cells go from a genotype, from a DNA sequence, to a phenotype. And starting out, again, Beetle and Tatum thought that uh, from their initial experiments, it looked to them like there was a one-to-one -one relationship between genes and proteins. So that idea came to be known as the central dogma of gene expression. There's a one-to-one -one relationship between genes and proteins. And this idea is mostly true, but as with a lot of things in biology, the real story is much more complicated than that. So for example, sometimes DNA can code for RNA that doesn't actually get translated. We've actually seen three examples of this in these lectures on gene expression. So for example, tRNAs, those transfer RNAs that transfer amino acids onto a growing polypeptide chain the tRNAs never get translated. They do their job as RNA. Similarly, there's RNA incorporated into ribosomes as a whole, and that ribosomal RNA also does not itself get translated. And then lastly, 
uh, the SNRPs that are involved in the spliceosome, so uh, that are involved in the process of splicing out introns and leaving behind exons, that there's RNA present in those SNRPs that also never gets translated. So it does its job as RNA. So, so that's an exception to this central dogma. So here are genes that just go to produce RNA, and then the RNA is the final product. Along with that, when we uh, examined the process of transcription in eukaryotes, we also talked about how you could go from a single primary transcript that includes regions that are introns and exons to different spliced final processed pieces of mRNA. And the final processed piece of mRNA, it might include all of the exons for a gene, or it might only include some of the exons for a gene. So that alternative splicing process means that you could have a single gene that could be used to produce multiple different types of proteins, depending on how that mRNA gets spliced. So, you know, this kind of uh, caused something of a dilemma for molecular biologists. What do we do now that, you know, this idea of this central dogma going from one gene to one protein has been, you know, shot down by the biological reality? Well, we have to come back and come up with a more modern definition of a gene. So here's a modern definition of what a gene is. So a gene is a region of DNA that can be expressed to produce a final functional product, either a polypeptide or an RNA molecule. So that's our final definition of what a gene is. And I hope that now you have a much deeper appreciation for you know what that gene physically is you know what it is that um, you know eventually leads to different phenotypes in organisms it's a particular dna sequence uh, that produces a particular amino acid sequence and that amino acid sequence you know will be a polypeptide that forms a protein that does some kind of job inside of the cell. So it's gonna catalyze reactions inside of the cell. And that process of catalyzing different reactions inside of the cell, creating different products, um, is what winds up resulting in different phenotypes for cells. So, you know, you don't need to memorize what's on this slide, but you do need to have a very good working understanding of the processes of gene transcription, modification, and gene translation. And I want you to have that understanding because I think it's really amazing to have this appreciation for how we actually go physically from a genotype, a DNA sequence, to a phenotype. And that concludes our series of videos on gene expression. So from here, we're going to transition next into talking about how the process of gene expression itself gets regulated. So how some genes get turned on and how some genes get turned off so that our cells are not simultaneously expressing all of the genes that are present uh, in the DNA in that cell.